Hello, I'm Dale Azrael. I am a core faculty member at Naropa University, and I teach in the Transpersonal Counseling and Psychology program. I've been teaching in this role as core faculty for over 20 years. I'd like to say a few words about the video that follows this brief segment. It was a video I recorded last year during one of our admissions days. On our admissions days, I always spend an hour with prospective students in the meditation hall at Paramita campus where the Graduate School of Counseling and Psychology is housed. And during that time, I introduce the prospective students to the practice of sitting mindfulness meditation as it is taught as Naropa. And I speak with them about the importance of this kind of training of the mind to develop some of the key qualities of the counseling relationship. We have been very fortunate during the past recent decades because so many excellent teachers and authors have been producing work about this theme, the interface between training the mind through meditation and developing the skills that are so important in the counseling relationship. One of the first was Naropa's founder, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who, as many of you may know, was a Tibetan person trained in a very traditional way from early childhood to become a teacher and leader and meditation master, and then escaped to India and then came to the West and brought the teachings of Buddha Dharma and meditation to many, many fields of study in the West, including as part of the founding heritage of Naropa University. When he came to the West, one of the things that he said and wrote is, Buddhism will come to the West as a psychology. What he meant by that was not it would be a type of psychology, but rather that the key training of Buddhism, which is meditation, was actually a very highly developed system of studying the mind. The meditation practice becomes a method by which people from all walks of life can look deeply into the workings of our human mind and see our minds in action, both in the development of confusion and also in the discoveries of our inherent capacities for wakefulness and clarity, empathy and compassion. Other Naropa teachers who have written about the same topic are the late Dr. Edward Podvall and Dr. Karen kissel both bringing out many, many details of how meditation provides the means for counselors to learn to be excellent facilitators for their clients' discoveries and awakenings. Other recent authors whose work we study in the Transpersonal Counseling and Psychology program include John Wellwood, Jack Hornfield, Mark Epstein, Tara Brock, Rick Hansen, Dan Siegel, and many others. In the video that follows from our admissions day, I will be especially focusing on the work of two authors Shauna Shapiro and Linda Carlson from their writing about how mindfulness meditation develops the qualities of empathy and attunement for the counseling relationship. And this comes from their book called The Art and Science of Mindfulness. I hope that you will enjoy the video that follows. This is Naropa's meditation hall at Paramita campus. Each of our three campuses has a meditation hall. And this is what we have in place of a school chapel. 
The meditation halls are open during all the hours that the buildings are open, and they are available during all that time for any form of silent meditation or other contemplative practice. Let's begin with a bow. First taking our seat, bringing our attention completely into the body, allowing ourselves to fully arrive right here, right now. Turning toward whatever is vulnerable inside of us so that we include that important aspect of our own being. And making the gesture of bowing to one another, a sign of mutual respect. Whenever I bow with students at the beginning of a class, one of the things that the bow reminds me of is that even though one person might be designated as the instructor and others designated as students in a given situation, in reality, all of us have a great deal to learn from one another. And all of us have a lot to teach each other. So this will be our introduction to the approach to sitting meditation that we use at Naropa and in the Transpersonal Counseling Program. But just to ask before we start, how many of you already are meditators? And if you're sitting in the front, you can't really see how many hands raised behind you. But it was either all or almost all. And I think that says something about people who are interested in the approach to contemplative education, which is practiced at Naropa. It is a mindfulness-based approach to contemplative education, and in this program, a mindfulness-based approach to transpersonal studies. So what is mindfulness? A word we're hearing a lot these days. It's um, showing up regularly in some of the major newspapers, like the New York Times, some of the major periodicals. What is it? It's a word that can lose its meaning because it's being used so much. And you will find many, many definitions. But one simple way to think about it is that it is entering into a state of being in which here and now experience is sensed directly with a quality of openness, with interest, and with a general attitude of acceptance, non-judgmental attention. And we have this as human beings. We're born with this capacity to pay attention. It's our birthright. But what we don't have without training is the ability to sustain that kind of attention over a long period of time, and sometimes in the midst of either extreme emotions or chaotic situations. That's when we contend as human beings to find our attention is fragmented, and then we're not as available to the situation as we might be. So mindfulness practice, meditation, as you know, if that's the kind of meditation you practice, is a system of training our attention. All of the different religions and world wisdom traditions I've ever looked into and studied all have training of the attention as part of the, the training that they provide. And of course, if we're going to be uh, practicing prayer or visualization or sacred dance or mantra, any kind of sacred ritual, we need to pay attention. And the same is true in the counseling relationship. The very famous study by Seligman showed that of all the different variables that could be 
um, perceived and tested in the different approaches to counseling therapy, what was the most significant quality in terms of the outcome in which there was real transformation and growth and healing in the client? He was doing the study to investigate whether different techniques and modalities were more effective than others. What did he find? I know some of you have studied this. What's most important? The relationship between the client and the therapist. The relationship between the client and the therapist. That's what has, you could say, the most effect on healing. And of course, it can't just be any relationship. It has to be a relationship that has the qualities of unconditional positive regard, to use Roger's term, that has the qualities that lead to rapport, to creating a feeling of safety and trust in which the client can do his or her work and feel held in a container of the therapist's or counselor's attention. So what would be some other qualities of that rapport? If you can think about a time, perhaps when you have felt held in a container of someone's attention that was healing for you, what are some of the qualities? Compassion. Could you say it louder? Compassion. Compassion. Understanding. Understanding. Empathy. Empathy. Trust. Trust. Presence, very important. We can tell if someone is present with us or not. We can tell if someone is physically sitting with us and mentally creating their shopping list. So mindfulness meditation, of course, is very, very ancient practice. And it has shown over many, many generations in the cultures in which it was part of human life and training, it has been shown to allow us to become present in a way that is open-ended, interested in whatever is occurring, and caring, empathic. Now, with so much research being done, there is also evidence that mindfulness meditation um, affects both the functioning and the structure of the brain. And especially the areas of the brain in which attention uh, is centered. And the kinds of attention that mindfulness will uh, cultivate and strengthen are first the ability to place the attention on whatever aspect of the present moment we choose. And then the ability to notice when our attention is no longer in the present, to notice when we're thinking about the past or the future, or even having a conversation with ourselves and our thoughts about the present. That's not the same as being present. And then the ability to quickly and without self-criticism bring the attention back into the embodied present. And the more that we can do that, the more that that becomes uh, a very familiar and perhaps even with training an automatic way of being, practicing mindfulness while we're sitting with a client or engaged in any other aspect of our lives, we are more fully available to that interaction or that situation. And when we're available, when a fuller and fuller aspect of our attention is present, then our own innate capacities for interest, warmth, caring are available, can come out. And mindfulness also will train us in being non-judgmental. Because the training, as you know, if you do mindfulness meditation, is to observe 
and greet each aspect of experience in the body, in the emotions, in the activity of our thoughts, and also in the environment, such as this sound of the fan that just went on. To be present, open, interested, and welcoming to all aspects of experience. So I think a very simple way to um, consider this, why, why is mindfulness meditation a required part of training in transpersonal counseling? Is that it teaches us how to attune. The quality of rapport between a counselor and client could be described as the counselor's attunement to the client. And we can feel it ourselves if someone is attuned with us. We can experience directly that quality of connection. Someone is with us and is holding the space for us. What we do in mindfulness meditation is we learn attunement with ourselves. Moment after moment, we are attuning to our own experience, connecting with it, observing it, welcoming it with that quality of curiosity and warmth or friendliness. And self-attunement, as you might call the practice of meditation, is the first step in developing the capacity for attunement toward others. In transpersonal studies, as we know, meditation is one of the primary doorways to consciousness. You could say it's like a, a portal through which we can um, discover deeper and deeper and more and more vast aspects of our own being. Aspects of our own being that transcend our own individual personalities and traits. So we've been sitting for quite a while on cushions now. And I'm going to suggest that we take one minute of just movement. And please use this as an opportunity just to stretch and to move in whatever way would benefit you. And then we will begin our sitting meditation. Beginning our meditation session together. Just as in the bow when we start with taking our seat, we begin our meditation that way as well. If these rectangular gamdens are a new kind of meditation cushion for you, I want to describe that the way of sitting on them is to sit down in the center of the cushion. And this would really be the same if you're on a round zafu or if you're meditating on a chair. And what we're trying to do is find a way of sitting that allows us to feel grounded and uplifted at the same time. So very important to take that first moment of sitting and really feel our meditation posture. Some people like to rock back and forth or perhaps side to side a little bit to find that place where we're really sitting down on the actual bottom of our torso in good contact with the cushion or the chair. If we're really sitting down, then it allows the alignment of our body to be upright and relaxed at the same time. Many people like to have their legs crossed, although some people prefer kneeling. A good hand position is allowing your arms to rest at the sides of your body and then slide your palms up over your thighs. Although some people prefer a more traditional meditation hand posture. And in our classes, we will give much more explicit instruction in all of these details. 
allowing the torso to rise naturally from our seat through the core and the soft tissues of the body into the throat and into the head, allowing the head to be in its natural alignment at the top of the spine as if we're gazing at the horizon. Letting the shoulders be relaxed, the belly is relaxed. Relaxing the back of the neck so that the chin is allowed to relax down a tiny bit. The lips and the jaw are soft. And if you like to sit with your eyes partly open with a downward gaze, then your gaze is soft. So here, even in the body, we have a combination of qualities that lends itself to presence and rapport as we build rapport with ourselves, with our own experience in meditation. Then it becomes naturally available when we're sitting with others. There's precision in the posture and gentleness at the same time. There is openness in which we can feel the movement of the breathing in the body. We can feel the breathing as we breathe in. And we can feel the breathing as our body releases or lets go of the breath. And then we're present as the next in-breath begins. And once we are in a good meditation posture that feels stable, that feels as comfortable as possible, that has a quality of relaxation and dignity at the same time, then in mindfulness meditation we can begin by placing our attention on what's called an object of attention, which means an aspect of the present moment which is very available, which can be experienced through our sense perceptions, and which is ongoing so that we can find it and come back to it easily. Of course, there can be many, many objects of attention. It could be a word, a sound, a physical sensation such as the heartbeat, But one of the most universal objects of attention, as many of you know very well, is our own breathing. It's a useful object of attention because everyone has this as long as we're alive. And because it's found in the body, to feel the breathing means that we are embodied. The mind and body are synchronized. And the breathing occurs only in the present moment. So feeling the breathing naturally directs our attention into this moment, just as it is. In mindfulness, as we feel the breathing, we also notice that other aspects of the present moment are occurring. We feel other physical sensations. If the eyes are partly open, we see in our visual field light, shadow, color, shape. We hear sounds. We hear silence. We may notice emotional feelings or textures of mood. 
and we notice our thoughts. And the practice in mindfulness meditation is to recognize what is occurring, to experience it with openness and interest, and then to guide our attention back home to the sensations of the body breathing. So when we notice a thought, we recognize that, that's a thought. Or it may be a long series of thoughts. We may be physically in the meditation hall and mentally in our admissions interview. So in mindfulness training, we learn to recognize, oh, that's a thought. No need to judge. And then gently escort the attention back home to the sensations of the body breathing. So let's sit together this way for a few minutes. And as we come to the end of this brief session of sitting meditation, pausing to allow yourself to experience what you feel in this moment. And then bringing attention to the next three breath cycles. How present can you be with your next three breaths? (laughs) 